Welcome to Down to Earth with Terry Vertz, where we talk about what matters down here on planet Earth. Today, I am super excited to have Lou Elizondo on our show. Lou is a former Pentagon official. He was also the director of the ATIP program, which we'll talk about, and a UAP expert, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. Lou, thank you for joining me. Terry, it is absolutely my sincere pleasure. And I just want to say before we begin, uh, you know, I really, really enjoy your show. And, and also, thank you for, uh, for your service to our country. I, I think I'm probably more excited to do this interview than you are probably <laughs> excited to, to interview me. This is a, well, a wonderful treat for me. No, I'm, I'm so glad. And thank you for coming on. We had uh, Chris Mellon on a few weeks ago, um, and he was amazing. And so this is kind of the follow on to Chris's episode for the, for the followers of our show. Um, well, well, unfortunately, I don't want to disappoint, but I, I'm not sure, Terry, I'm going to be able to match up to my, uh, to my esteemed colleague, Chris. So I'm just going to put that out there right now to you and your audience. Uh, I, uh, this will probably <laughs> be a bit of a disappointment. I've, having him on first is like, you know, having the rock star on stage first and then followed up by the warm up man. Nah, this is uh so we've got, you know, before it was like the yeah, it was a warm up band before this is now Queen just came on stage or uh or uh Aerosmith just just took the stage. Um so first of all, I got to say, I normally don't sound like this. I know this is our first time doing a podcast. My hometown here in Texas baseball team um is in the state playoffs. I drove up to Texas A&M last night, 2 hour drive. They're 30 and 0. They got a kid who's going to get drafted in the first round who made the most unbelievable double play spinning 95 mile an hour throw to first base. I've never seen a double play like that. And they hadn't lost all year. They're ranked number one in the nation by Max Preps and they lost. They they looked awful. They had the worst game. I, you know, t- they lost 10 to 6. So my voice is a little bit worn out after that late night game last night. <laughs> Sure. Well, Terry, unfortunately, this is my normal voice and you're going to have to endure with it because uh, this it does not get any better. This is my <laughs> unfortunately what, what you see is what you get with me. Uh, I'm with you. And this, this is my normal face, too. Um, the people always tell me I've got a face for a radio. So I'm not sure. I, I think I think that's a compliment, but I'm not sure. Um, so so, Lou, this um, this has been kind of a crazy month or two months or a year or several years, really about uaps we used to call them ufos now they're uaps there's 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 stuff happening in the air that we don't fully understand and i'm going to come at this as you know i'm a former astronaut i've never seen you aliens or the every speech i do and i speak for a living somebody asks me about aliens and i'm happy to talk about it i've never seen one i've never seen a ufo myself but the things that people have been seeing now are so compelling. And it's not some old guy that's really into mushrooms and he was really into heroin in the 70s and he's seeing aliens. This is not what's happening at all. We have data, we have radar tracking stuff. And so I what I really want to do, I don't have a I don't have normally I have kind of a map of the interview. I have nothing for you. I want to find out are there drones out there? Are there balloons out there? Are there are there truly other things out there? And this is kind of the, where I want, I just want to hear what you have to say. Cause you're so interested. Sure. You've been on TV, you've been in documentaries, you've been in movies, you, you know, you're, you're and you were, and you were at the Pentagon. So I just want to have that conversation with you. Yeah, sure. Terry. Well, look, um, let me, let me begin by saying yes to all the above. Um, are there drones? Yes. Are there balloons? Yes. Are there weather anomalies? Yes. Are there aircraft? Yes. Are there missiles? Are there, you name it. Is there all? Is there conventional technology out there that we misidentify all the time? Absolutely. Um, that's but but that's not really what our concern was when I was in in the Pentagon. Um, our concern were those things that fell outside the the normal envelope, performance envelope of of conventional aircraft that you would at least consider to be conventional aircraft. To include, you know, even some of the more more exotic ones uh, that we we you know use some of the more high performance capabilities. Um, let me, if I may, let me start also with, with this. Um, the question is, is there a species that is able to, to, to be a space faring species? And the answer is unequivocally yes. We, we, are, we are one of them. Proof is in the pudding. Just, just look at us. You yourself spent some time in space. Uh, someone built some sort of technology to, 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 if you will, blow you out of Earth's orbit, albeit temporarily, 
And uh, you know, you 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 are living proof that that living things can indeed uh, can can become spacefaring. Now, the question you ask me is, are there things out there that are not us that have that same potential? And that's precisely what we're trying to find out, Terry. Uh, there are there's enough data to suggest that there are things operating within our our own airspace that is is a it's not ours. B, we're pretty sure it's not foreign adversarial. C, it's been doing this for a long time. And D, uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. And so there, therein lies the issue. My, my background, I'm not a UFO guy. I'm, I'm not a ufologist. I'm just a former investigator and an, an intelligence officer. So my job was always to, to very simply collect the truth and speak the truth. That's it. And then present that information to a jury and, and let them decide. Uh, in this case, you and your audience are the jury. What I happen to personally think about something or feel about something is rather irrelevant, to be honest with you. It's just like an investigator. You know, you don't. The jury doesn't ask, "Well, how do you feel about this?" It's, right. It doesn't matter how I feel. What matters is what does the data say, and and then what matters is what you and your audience think about this or feel about it, not me. And so, uh, from that perspective, my job, the job of Chris Mellon, is 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 fairly narrowly focused to really just collecting the facts and then presenting those facts to to the jury, or in this case, a court of public opinion. Um, if there is enough information there that that your government, my government, was willing to spend our taxpayer dollars, and, and, and by the way, it wasn't chump change either, uh, to, to look into this. Um, and and uh, the results of that information was, was very compelling. And now you have the eyewitness testimony of pilots uh, and, and, and very you know, no-nonsense people such as yourself who spent time in the military, spent time even in space, coming out and say, yeah, you know what? I didn't want to say this before, but I, but I saw something kind of weird too. And uh, you know, there, there we, there we have it. Yeah. The thing that strikes me about that is that the kind of people who are speaking up, you know, the fravor and th these kind of guys and gals um, are the kind of people when they wake up in the morning, their goal for the day is to not see a UFO. Like as a fighter pilot, they don't want to see UFOs though. I can't imagine anything I would less other than crashing. You know, if I saw something like that and I reported it, I would be that guy, I would get a nickname in the squatter and I'd have a new call sign. You know, these are the kind of people that are not wanting, you know, to see this and yet they have seen it and they're, they're kind of doing their duty to, uh, to uh, speak up about it. So talk well, if you're lucky, they'll, they'll change your call sign. If you're unlucky, they'll take you off flight status. They'll give you a right. psychological evaluation right. and, you know, you'll spend the rest of your career, probably, uh, you know, cleaning out uh, jet turbine engines. What is ATIP? Talk, talk about that. I, I mentioned the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Is that right? Is this yes, Harry Reid? So, Harry yeah. Reid uh, funding. Is that what that was? Well, it was your funding. It wasn't Harry Reid funding. That's true. Harry Reid was, you know, Harry Reid. Harry Reid didn't pay for it. Harry Reid right. was was courageous enough to to support this effort and, and right. champion it. But right. but make no mistake, you paid for it. Your audience right. paid for it. Taxpayer money paid for it. And right. Uh, you know, it was it was a very very much a legitimate program. It had evolved a little bit over time from the from its nascent stage when it was first uh, you know on the books in I think late two thousand seven, early two thousand eight. Uh, it morphed a little bit. It was originally under the the umbrella called OSAP, and uh, OSAP was you know another <laughs> wonderful DoD acronym uh, that was used. But later on, that it it really kind of evolved into into the to the eight what everybody now knows as a tip and, and now the uap task force so yeah, when i came to nasa as an astronaut i i was an air force guy so i thought you know it's like learning a new language i thought the air force was pretty impressive at acronyms but nobody holds a candle to nasa it is like it really is a new language it you know it's like i had to learn russian and i had to learn nasa when i went to nasa um so the so these are programs that are that were officially funded by the DOD, and they were looking into this phenomenon. And now there's a new bill. It just came out at the, the very tail end of the Trump administration. Somebody snuck in this language that the, the DOD had to come up with a report within six months that uh, of what's going on with all this stuff. And, and I was laughing with Chris when Chris <coughs> was there. There's some poor, and I, I don't know. And one of the proudest things about my 30 plus years of Air Force service is that I've never been to the Pentagon. I've literally never set foot. In the I, you know, I high God five, bless you. <laughs> I high five myself every day that I've never been there. 
But um, I can imagine in my brain, I see this poor 06. It's some colonel or maybe a Navy captain who has to go around and meet the admiral and meet the general and everybody hates him. He hates his job. Now he's never going to make admiral or general because it sucks to be him. And I, I can just imagine there's not a lot of excitement inside the building. Is that true? Or are people, it was probably different in 2008. I'm guessing now it's a little bit more accepted, but I can, I can just uh, imagine this bureaucratic resistance to what's. You yeah. Know, like, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll share with you. <laughs> uh, we affectionately, those of us who worked at the Pentagon, we had kind of a nickname for it. We affectionately referred to it as, as the death star. And so, you know, you go and you got, you get your assignment back at the death star and you got to go right. back to, <laughs> to headquarters. Um, <laughs> You know, there. The, unfortunately, the UAP task force was born out of, of political pressure. Um, there was enough pressure being placed on the Pentagon publicly and from our legislators that the Pentagon was 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 forced to create this capability. Now, there were elements in there that I have to applaud. For example, uh, DepSec Dep Norquist. Um, he took a, a a chance and created this because he he knew it was important to follow. But unfortunately, there are also pockets of resistance within the Pentagon, and right. and those pockets of resistance are are still very influential and very vocal. And and yeah, they they make people's lives miserable. Why are we doing this? Why are we studying this? You know, why are we spending our time, money, and resources on it? Uh, and you know, ultimately, those pockets were never briefed. They were certainly not briefed by me. And they they I suspect they're they're probably reluctant because it's first of all you have mission creep as you know in the, in the government yeah. right so we get yeah. every day we get more and more added to our plate nothing ever falls off you know everything's a priority right two uh i think there's a fundamental lack of understanding of, of what we're dealing with and when you're looking at for example the height of the cold war um and by the way the the, the efforts of atip were have been going on for decades it wasn't mm -hmm. called atip at one time it was called project blue book and whatnot right. but the bottom line, we, we, we've seen these things in our skies for, for quite some time, displaying these beyond next generation technologies. Um, so so we've, we've always known the real. The problem is there wasn't a whole lot we could do about it. And also at the time, we were, we were thrust in the middle of, of what we called the Cold War, which, by the way, coincidentally, wasn't very cold. It was a pretty hot war, to be honest with you. But, right. um, you know, the, the big threat there was nuclear proliferation and, and then the threat of, of, of Soviet Union. So those were very clearly definable threats. And, right. and you and I were, were products of, of that genre. And yeah. so uh, that was, that was you know, that's a very clear uh, enemy that you can look at and say, okay, they've got nukes, they're hostile, they don't like us, we're playing this game of chess on a global scale through proxy wars and whatnot. That's a, a very easy enemy to define. Yeah. When you are talking about UAPs, that we don't, there's two things to determine if something is a threat. We have capabilities versus intent. Well, we've seen some of the capabilities. We have no idea the intent. Right. And since there's no overt hostile action being taken by these things, and a lot of the information at the time was anecdotal, I think there was a conscious decision by the Pentagon brass to say, you know what? Yes, we kind of know they're there, but since they're not bothering us, let's go ahead and focus our time and attention on, on those things that, that, that are bothering us. Right? Yeah, like, Syria, whatever, yeah. Absolutely, you know, crisis du jour. So right. I, I think, I think that probably is part of it too. There is a, a, a tremendous amount of social stigma and taboo yeah. uh, associated with this topic because we haven't done ourselves any favors. We spent seventy years putting out, you know, silly Hollywood B movies and people wearing right. tinfoil hats and right. you know these 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 UFO conventions where people wear green suits and Elvis on the right. mothership. When in reality, that's not at all what we're talking about. What we're talking about some sort of advanced technology that is is in some cases behaving fairly provocatively at this point and when i say provocatively i don't mean necessarily hostile what i mean is provocative yeah uh absolutely. and uh yeah and and you know now it's to the point where where we really simply can't ignore it anymore so right. uh that's kind of kind of where we are at, at, you know as, as a snapshot so to speak so how many years were you there doing this digging around in the in the pentagon uh almost 10 from 2008 and then uh, i left in 2017 Okay. Almost and then, did you meet Chris Mellon while you were at the Pentagon then? I did. I did. Uh, you know, very, very tenacious man. I, re I respect Chris tremendously. Um, I've said before, there's five people on, on this hand that I can, I can count. And if they told me, called me at four in the morning and said, put your boots on, uh, I need right. you to go with me to war, I would do it. And Chris Mellon's in that category. This is, yeah. this is a person who's no nonsense, held one of the most senior positions in the yeah. Pentagon. 
also worked for uh, our, our legislative branch, was one of the, the, the founding fathers of Special Operations Command, SOCOM. And, um, you know, he, he found his way to me. And, and the conversations, I, I spent about four or five months probably pushing him away uh, <laughs> and trying to come up with every excuse I could not to brief him on. Right. And ultimately, he had managed to jump through all the, the administrative hoops. Uh, and, and at that point, there was no reason why I, I, I had to tell him because he had all the clearances that I asked him to get. Right. Which, frankly, between us, I thought it would never happen. Uh, you know, I, th- right. I, I told one of my, my ops officers, I said, well, we don't have to worry about him. We'll never see him again. Uh, because I know some of those read-ons took about, about a year to get, if not longer. Right. And he came right. back the next week. So at that yeah. point, I, I, I recognized, okay, this guy, this guy means business. He's legit. Um, he's an amazing guy. Oh, he is. He yeah. is absolutely. He, he's, he's truly a national treasure. Uh, yeah. Incredible human. He does not have to be doing this. Uh, you know, yeah. he's got a, a, a tremendous reputation from, from, from the, his family, right? right? And yet he decided to, to risk it all to have this conversation with the American people. So for that, I, right. I respect him tremendously. He's, and, right. and he's also a very dear friend, too. Right. He's a good guy. I mean, he's Chris Mellon from Pittsburgh. Uh, it was funny. I was telling my friend who's he's running a business be, and he's in Pittsburgh because of Carnegie Mellon and the amount of tech, uh, the the people there. Like there's a lot of great uh, uh, talent to hire. And I was like, you know, you're at Carnegie Mellon. I need to put you in touch with this guy, Chris, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, wait a minute. He's Chris Mellon. OK, never mind. That's, yeah, it's Never, never mind, Chris. You're you're already a, attached with Carnegie Mellon, so yeah, amazing. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> yeah, I was. I, I it took me. I'm slow, man. I'm just an Air Force fighter pilot. So, um, and, and his family is beautiful too, by the way. Yeah. I mean, just it's it's not just Chris. He he's got this incredible support mechanism. It's his children, yeah. his his lovely wife. Just just a, you know, su- super 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 human being and a super family. Right. Well, for those listening to the podcast, if you get a chance, listen to the episode with Chris Mellon because it was pretty good and. And this will be a good follow on. So you're at the Pentagon, you're working on this ATIP program, which in some ways is like a follow on to Project Blue Book that, you know, we all saw TV shows about when we were kids. Um, and there's, there's shit happening in the skies. And what, so I, I want to talk about like what was happening, like what could be going on that would cause the Pentagon and Harry Reid and all this millions of dollars and undersecretaries of defense to get you know, focused on it. What was happening? I, I just kind of want to lay it out. Everybody's seen the Navy video and blah, blah, blah. Let's just talk about like from A to Z, what, what was going on? What, what has sure. been happening? Yeah. Well, when you say what was happening is actually, uh, it was the opposite is why, why Chris and I got so engaged because we kept getting reports from the field. Um, in some cases, some 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 very uh, emotional pleas from from some very senior people saying, "Hey, look, I got these all over the ship. You know, I, I can't keep people below deck forever. What do you want me to do?" Right. And so, uh, my intent was to you know wow. bring the cavalry, sound the bugle, and bring the cavalry. Say, "Look, I got it, sir. Got it, ma'am. We are working on some solutions for you." The problem is the cavalry never came. I would go up and I'd brief it to seniors and they say, this is interesting. This is fantastic. Great. Uh, but we don't want to let the boss know. And as, Who's as a senior? you know, the boss was. What is a senior? So, a senior is uh, the number one, number two people in the Pentagon. We're talking about people that are working with the secretary of defense in his suite that are the the senior. I don't want to say their position because then people know who they are and they haven't right. come out publicly yet. Right. But these were, were were some of the most senior people in the Department of Defense. Uh, they were his his direct his his, his confidants. Think of uh, his uh, senior advisors, right? I know. And I know who you're talking about. This is why I'm having this conversation. Is one of those seniors approach me? So anyway, yeah. I, I and know, and, and, and they and by the way, it, it's for the record, it wasn't their fault. Okay, they right. you know hindsight always being twenty twenty. I understood. Right. I was frustrated because I was I was an operator. My my job is to. To, to identify uh, issues and find solutions. Um, we had a new Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis. This is a person that I had the, the honor to serve with in combat, an incredible human being. But the Great bureaucracy man. Man. Yeah. was, yeah, an, an incredible. One of the, again, on my top five, for sure. Yeah. Um, and this is a man, as you know, and I know, always has a career of, of always wanting to have more, his success is based on more information, not less. Right. But the Praetorian guards were keeping that from him. 
um, for, and, and, you know, I, I understand now why, um, because they were trying to protect the boss. He had this incredible reputation as, you know, mad dog, baddest, the man, the myth, the legend. And all of a sudden, if he got questioned by Congress or, or the media, say, hey, have you been briefed on UFOs? They didn't want to put him in that situation. They were, they were trying to protect him while at the same time find solutions uh, right. for, for our issues at the more tactical and operational level. But, but unfortunately, there was this almost paralysis by analysis where right. I'd go back, we'd perform more briefings, I'd get more eyewitnesses to come in, they would brief, we'd show videos, we'd show you know, analysis, we'd show photos, we'd have the reports and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, there was this, this hesitation. Uh, the, the first person I briefed, they actually didn't even want to have a conversation. I spent an hour and a half briefing this individual. Uh, and, and, and at the conclusion of the briefing, I, I remember it clear as day yesterday, he looked at me and he said, so how does, how does you know, Miami, Miami Hurricanes do it? You know, how's the football team doing this season? And I was, uh, you know, I was, I was shocked because I spent an hour and a half and it just wasn't seen. He just couldn't process it. Right. Right. And then other times I remember you tell, I would, I would brief a senior and they kind of looked at you and kind of smile after 20 minutes and said, man, is this a joke or, or you, you're kind of wasting my time here. Right. Because I got, I got real important things to do. And then lastly, uh, one of the seniors um, fortunately took it seriously. And, and he actually uh, a former fighter pilot himself. Mm-hmm. And he was actually very helpful. Um, unfortunately, we, we still failed to get it to, to, to secretary Mattis. But right. he was sympathetic and, and he, he looked at it and he took the briefings and we had the you know, pilots come in, the, uh, the radar operators come in. And, and you know, he, he, I, I, I truly believe sincerely he was trying to find a solution. But he, he was also caught between protecting his boss yeah. and, and also, you know, doing what's necessary to help the field. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I'd been doing this for, for almost 10 years. And, and finally, you know, for me, the clock ran out. I, I said, yeah. look, guys, I, I don't have the horsepower. I, I don't have the funding and the resources anymore to do the right job. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm failing the people of the field. They're, they're expecting me for a resolution. And I keep telling them we're going to give them one. And, and, and we don't. And so finally, I, I, I said, out of protest, I submitted my resignation. And by the way, for the record, that senior at DOD, I have no hard feelings at all about. Right. Uh, he's, I, 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 if I was in his position, hell, I, I probably would have done it exactly like, like he did. So yeah. again, this is not a blame game. You know, this yeah. is just the bureaucracy. It really, it, it not only did, did it, it affected me and, and the people in the field, but I think it also affected him as well. I think he was put in a really difficult position. Uh, and the bureaucracy didn't, there was no mechanism to report this type of information. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, and he is new to the job. So he had just come in. He's like, look, you know, we don't even have a U S new, a USDI yet. We've got an acting USDI. Half of the chain of command isn't even in place yet. You know, uh, we gotta, we gotta sit on this a little bit longer and, you know, a little bit longer became a little bit longer and a little bit longer. It's, so. it's the Pentagon. It's bureaucracy. One of those individuals actually pulled me aside at a, at a meeting one time and, he was like, Terry, you got to, and he told me what was going on and it kind of blew me away. So that's why we're having this conversation is because of one of those individuals. So there's, yeah. so the bottom line is for the listeners, there's bureaucracy. It is impressive um, at the, the Pentagon bureaucracy. It's the largest organization in human history. I mean, it is. in terms of dollars, there's never been a larger organization. So you can imagine when there's, you know, a billion here, a billion there before long, you're talking about real money there's a lot of internal resistance to anything that's going to change, whatever I, I can only imagine, but you said something just then Lou in that, in that, this, what you were just saying that kind of blew me away. There were Navy boat ship captains that were having to keep their crew under below decks because there were things flying around. That's correct. Like, that's a that's a Hollywood movie from the eighties. Oh, I'll tell you, man. Some of this stuff was was absolutely riveting. One of Let's these days, the story. Let's talk about the stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I'll share with you uh, <laughs> one one interesting um, uh, event that occurred. Uh, it's it's pretty incredible. Um, you have. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I want people to know who it is. I, I you know, the person is kind of yeah. very cagey about this, but. Uh, uh, you have a helicopter going out of uh, a Caribbean island on a, on a regular basis because the Navy likes to test fire uh, some of its, its its cruise missile technology and whatnot. 
And what will happen is that that after the, the cruise missile runs out of fuel, it kind of falls into the splashes into the ocean, it will sink. And then at a certain time, it kind of it kind of rises up and we, we go and fetch it. Uh, and we, we, we analyze it for telemetry and things like that. Uh, long story short, helicopter crew goes out uh, to, to recover one of these things. Uh, as they are recovering it uh, the first time, the missile, uh, they're pulling up and, and something, what was described round and circular about the size of a small island, uh, black, dark color starts rising to the surface. It doesn't break the water, but it starts rising to the surface. They, they thought, wow, that's really, really peculiar. Well, the next month, goes around and they go out to retrieve this, uh, this, this, the, another missile that was test fired. And this time we've got a frogman hanging down from the rope about to, to latch on to the, to the missile. And uh, this thing starts coming out of the water again. And if you know about the Puerto Rican trench out there, you're talking about water that's 22,000 feet deep. It's, yeah. it's the second deepest part of the ocean. The thing starts rising up and, and as the thing is starting to come to the surface, the frogman is, is literally trying to climb the rope they're doing an emergency ascent everybody is absolutely panic at the disco freaking out uh you know what the hell is that what's going on and as they start to pull up uh it's it, it sucks the missile underwater and then disappears never to be seen again uh i mean there's there, there's 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 incidents like that that just kind of make the hair stand up on the back of your neck and go, what when was that when was that uh i it, it uh, a, while ago. It was a little while ago. I I don't yeah. want to go into too yeah. much detail because, like I yeah. said, I, I, the person wants their privacy. Yeah, uh, I I know the individual personally. I've talked to him. He he's not. Uh, he does not want any type of of publicity. He's actually, I think, kind of uh, averse to it. He doesn't want to be. Okay. He's kind of seen what happened to me and others. So he's like, you know, I, Lou, I don't want any any part of that. Like I said at the beginning, the kind of people who are making these reports are the kind of people who wake up in the morning and they say, all right, today I'm not going to see a UFO because if I do, it's right. going to screw my career. And then if you're the UFO guy at the Pentagon, how does that help your career? Right. So that's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard that, Lou. And even in the doc, I've, I've watched a phenomenon and I've, you know, I've watched several of the things that you've been on. I've never heard that story before. Yeah. Um, so yeah. in my mind all these different events. And I wanna, I'd like for you to maybe walk through the timeline or just categorize them. There's the Tic Tacs, these nondescript, you know, cylinders that the Navy fighter pilots saw in 2004 that went really fast from the ocean to space to high speeds, whatever. And that's truly not explainable. There are these triangles that look like drones that have lights flashing and I think people in Belgium around the world, but I want you to talk about those. They may or may not be drones. And then there's these things that look like balloons. They're kind of translucent balloon looking things. So there's the triangles, the balloons and the Tic Tacs. Those are the three things that I've heard about. Chris talked about one that went from Canada down to Cuba and we weren't able to intercept it. But I let's just like, I don't know, somehow organ, there's all these things and you, I, my brain gets confused. I'm a linear thinker. So let's, sure. let's like go A, B, C, D. What yeah. are these different things? Sure, let's, now, there, now there's the island that's floating out of the Caribbean. I never heard of that before. Yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, deconstruct a little bit. Well, the island may be enigmatic of, of something that we've seen before. When the pilots first described the Tic Tac in 2004, they notice an object just under the water and the yeah. water seemed to be roiling on top. Turning, and so, right. right, churning. And so, you know, we, we may be dealing with something something similar. We don't know uh, yet, but but certainly there's some, some interesting congruencies. Um, two, when we talk about the Tic Tac, and then I'll get into some of the other questions you had specifically. Um, this is, you know, we call it the Tic Tac, but you your, view, your audience might be surprised to know that in the 1950s, these things were still being reported through official US government channels, but they were being described as 40 foot white flying butane tanks, which looks an awful lot like a Tic Tac. And then they were being described in the 60s as white flying lozenges, right? Uh, again, <laughs> that cylindrical object doing performing exactly the same way. Was that um, in Blue so book? there's a lot of book? Uh, no, these are some other documents that, that at some okay. point we'll probably see the light of day very soon. Um, so there's, okay. there's a long history here of, of of these vehicles being reported. And basically, depending on the genre you grew up in, 
you know, it's either a butane tank, it's a tic tac, right. it's a lozenge, you know, it's just, right. it's, it, it's a label that we give because of, of the sign of the time. Right. Uh, but they're describing the same object. Now, you kind of go into a question as far as categories and descriptions. So there is the historical lenticular shape or, or saucer shape that people are familiar with. Right. Uh, then there is another category or perhaps classification of observed craft, which is a long cylindrical uh, or, or oval shaped craft, which tends to be a little bit bigger than, than the disc shaped craft. And then you have uh, these much, much larger triangular shaped vehicles that have been described. And then the really, really big ones are almost like boomerang. Right. Um, one of the observations that we had in, in ATIP uh, among many, was that uh, it could very well be that these vehicles look the way they do because of, of the specific function. So what do I mean? The, the disks tend to be, tend to be, not always, but tend to be observed as being small type of craft. So think of a Corvette. You can fit two people in a Corvette and you can zoom around the streets all day long. Right. But let's say you now need a school bus. You need something bigger than a Corvette because you want to put more people in it or more equipment or more supplies, you know, whatever. Uh, you need a bigger vehicle. And so you have that long cylindrical school bus that may be for, for other reasons. And then let's say we need uh, not a school bus, but we need an aircraft carrier. I need something so big, I can put a whole lot of people, a whole lot of equipment to do a very specific function. Well, um, that would maybe be your triangles. It, it could very well be that the triangular craft are so big because they're performing a very specific function. And right. those tend to be the very, very big craft. And then on rare occasion, occasions are, are reported a, an enormous craft, which tends to look like a boomerang. Uh, think of a cylinder, but bent. Uh, and, and you have this just enormous, enormous vehicle. Uh, there is some speculation uh, why these vehicles are shaped the way they're shaped and perform the way they perform. I, I, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but it may very well be that the, the shape of the craft is, is, is specific to the function and mission of a specific, no different than us in humans, right? Uh, an F-16 looks like an F-16 because it's designed to be an interceptor, right. whereas uh, a B-52 looks like a B-52 because it's designed to carry a lot of weight and, and, and drop, you know, bombs, ordnance. Right. Uh, you know, they're, they're both aircraft, but, but they look differently, they function differently because they perform different missions. Okay. But th are those basically, uh, in terms of all these things that different people are seeing, there's the triangles, there's the balloons, there's the Tic Tacs, and there's like well, UFO, there's the saucer. So those kind of the four basic types. Uh, of yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, again, misidentifications out there. You know, the more, the more people get sense. Here's, here's the, the catch-22 in this whole thing. The more people are aware of the reality of a UAP, the more people are going to look to the skies and the more we're going to misidentify things. Right. But that's right. okay because right. I think I, I think you, you have to figure out a way to separate the wheat from the chaff. And in this particular right. case, uh, this is precisely what the Pentagon is trying to figure out. And I, and I think people should be patient because there's going to be a lot of things misidentified uh, in, in the beginning. Well, um, been, but then there's things. Let, let's talk about the data. So I'm, you know, as a test pilot, I used a lot of different types of radar. I use a lot of different infrared cameras and tracking systems. Uh, and in the 50s and 60s, we didn't really have great, we had some stuff, but you know, that that data is a lot better. The Navy spy one radar on these Aegis cruiser, you know, these big giant electronically scanned array radars. Is that true that with the higher quality tracking data that we have? the better data we're getting on these types of things. Is that true? Yeah, so it is. Let me let me kind of put this into perspective. In the old days, and you, you made up a very good, brought up a very good point. Let's say you have a, a radar tower. You had one radar tower sending out a, 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 a radar beam in a particular frequency, and that radar signal gets bounced back off of an object and it comes back. So you're transmitting and receiving, and, and very much like sonar, but from the electromagnetic perspective, Right. You're, you're picking up that object and its reflection of a signal. Right. Uh, as we got better and better with radar data, uh, when you talk about the SPY-1 radar, the SPY-1 radar really isn't just a radar. It is, it is a suite of collection sensors. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because some of it's probably a little bit sensitive. But think of a, a radar that now has the ability to talk to other radars and, mm -hmm. and then integrate that information and create a common operating picture of the battle space or, or the operating area, how about that? And so it's not just picking up its own signal it's sending out, it's integrating other radar right. 
that's right. coming in them that may be, uh, you know, uh, airborne based radar, uh, ground based radar. And it's, it's integrating all of that. It's looking at all the various different bits and pieces of information to give you a much more uh, higher fidelity picture of, of on a the Navy area. Ship. And spy one on a on... Navy ship. Yeah, right. Okay. Correct. The spy one radar. And so, so you're looking in essence, being able to pick up a baseball at 80,000 feet. That's, that's how sensitive these things are, right. uh, and which is extremely capable, far much better than, than what we had back in the 50s. And, and you said it yourself, you know, it, we've come a long way in our evolution. So it's important to know that even our aircraft now, and I don't need to tell you this, but you know what, the modern day aircraft is really much, it's pretty much a flying sensor. Unit. It is yeah. designed to, to pick up anything and everything. It's not just a weapons platform anymore. It's, right. it's much more. And that information then gets fed back to the ship. And of course, all that information then is, is processed and analyzed. Uh, so now the same picture you're seeing on, this, on, on the boat can now be the same picture you're seeing in the aircraft, which right. is the same picture that the generals are going to be seeing, you know, sitting at a fob, which is the same picture that people are going to be seeing on the E-2 Hawkeye. That's, right. That is what we spend our money on trying to, to create this, this battle space awareness. And so that's the technology we're dealing with today. So when you see something on radar, it's important for your audience to know it's not just a ghost in the machine. It's not just a blip that maybe your one particular radar is picking up because the radar systems of today are designed to automatically filter out. If all this radars aren't talking about, aren't seeing the same picture, there is some sort of uh, reconciliation that occurs internally right. to determine if it's something real or not. And if right. it's not, it typically will just filter it out. It's noise, right? So what I've read and you can enlighten this when the, in the 2004 incident, when they, Dave Fravor and others saw the Tic Tacs and the, and the op radar operators on those ships were seeing the, the, these things that data accidentally got deleted. <laughs> Is that true? There's been, there's been, well, radar, I guess there's been radar data. I, I, deleted. Yeah. I guess kind of like my, my emails at the Pentagon that have been accidentally deleted. Um, yeah. yeah no, I don't. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just one of those things, I guess, right? Yeah, uh, yeah there's there's some allegations there that information. Look, the deck logs are supposed to be to be to be be kept, and they usually get sent to the National NARA, National Archives uh, for for posterity's sake. Well, it's interesting because on the Princeton, the deck logs are missing for that very one day that they encountered the. That, the that's kickback. weird. That's really weird. That is weird, isn't it? Hmm. I wonder why. Yeah. The Princeton is the Navy destroyer with this super fancy spy one radar that was out there off the coast of California when these Navy fighter pilots saw these Tic Tacs. And now we've all seen the video through the New York Times and, and, and CNN yeah. and others. Yeah. Okay. He just, just to, class destroyer. Just to help the, help and, the listeners out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also important to know it wasn't just, just the spy one radar. It was also picked up. I, I spoke to the radar operators when I was back in Egypt. Uh, on the E2 Hawkeye. So, so you talked to the you talked to the Navy enlisted men and women and officers. oh yeah you talked to yeah, them that was my job okay and what they, they, they say the what did they say i had them come up to the secretary to, to secretary suite to brief the so, seniors so these poor e5s and o3s <laughs> had to go to the pentagon <laughs> and talk to yes top brass at the pentagon and what do they say yes uh well you know i think they were clearly a little bit nervous because you know you yeah. don't walk into the secretary suite every day so they're kind of like, i've never done it myself yeah <laughs> You know, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they provided their information. But what, what you had was this, this you had these workups. So let me let me kind of start from the beginning here for your audience who may not be uh, familiar with 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 military operations. So we have these the strategic uh, aircraft carrier strike groups. Think of um, a floating piece of the United States that we can move anywhere around the world. And when you think of an aircraft carrier, people think of this great big ship with a bunch of planes on the deck, but that's really only one part of, of the carrier fleet, okay? Mm -hmm. Those, these ships never sail alone. They've got right. escorts with them, they have defense mechanisms, they've got right. submarines, they've right. got right. all sorts of stuff, right. So, um, you know, what you're trying to do is replicate a piece of sovereign United States uh, and, and control that area anywhere in the world. Right. So, um, before the, the one of their deployments, uh, they were doing what they call workups, which is which is their exercises, their training, right. trying to right. replicate real world scenarios, uh, and so they can you know keep hone their skills and, and, and keep sharp before they actually have to go to combat or go to war. Right. So they're off the coast of California, they're off of San Diego, they're doing their workups about sixty miles off, I think, in the whiskey uh, operating area, and um, like they're, whiskey they're, they're, 
is a warning area as a like yep. it's an it's a piece of airspace that as a fighter pilot we go and do our exercises and the whiskey areas are off the coast so okay correct right uh and so uh we've got these uh we've got these these two f-18 hornets up there uh playing cat and mouse and you've got two others so you have a blue force and a red force you have a you have a, right. a, a good good guys and bad guys right, right? and you're gonna you're gonna do your war scenarios and so they're out there doing your thing and all of a sudden uh in the middle they get waved off they get this radio call coming in from the e2 hawkeye and saying hey guys um just a heads up we we, we see something on our radar initially the e2 hawkeye radar operator uh, thought it was maybe just wave top because a lot of times those radars are so sensitive that if you have a high enough wave you can pick those up uh, wow. But this was a, a calm and steady sea, sea state at the time. So they realized, hey, look, that's it's not a wave top. He says, well, I'm picking up something. And as they're having this conversation, the Princeton jumps in and says, yeah, we pick it up too. In fact, uh, we want you guys to stop doing your war games and we want you to go beat feet over and, and, and check this thing out. Um, so they were vectored to it. It's not like the pilot said, hey, I'm curious, let me go. No, no, no. The Princeton said, you will stop what you're doing and we want to reroute you and go take a look at what the hell that thing is going on. Okay. And this is so Dave the pilot Fraver. scope. This is Dave, Dave Fraver. Fraver. It's it's uh, I can I can the names I can say is Dave Fraver, Jim Slate, and and Alex Dietrich. Um, there's another person there, but they haven't come out publicly yet, so I'm not going to mention their name. Okay. So you have two two aircraft, a front seater pilot and a back seat Wizzo, you know, a, a weapons officer. Right. right. And so they're going out to to check out what this what, what's going on. So they boogie on over. Can use. Yeah, right. Maverick and Goose, you got it. Right. Uh, except for not F-14 Tomcats, they're flying yeah. F-18. F-18, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so they, uh, they they head on over, and uh, I remember talking to to one of the pilots, and the pilot was telling me, you know, I, initially I was excited. I thought maybe that we're going to go do some drug interdiction. You know, maybe there's some low-flying Cessna that's bringing in some dope, and we can right, go ahead. Right, Mexico, and, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, as they get to the area, they're getting closer, closer, closer. The Princeton says, okay, you're, you're right where you need to be, uh, you know, take, start looking around. And so they start looking around and, and pilots both look down and they see this, what seems to be this submerged object under the water was described as a, almost the size of a 737 underwater. So initially all of a sudden their hearts start Holy to race. They're thinking, oh no, we've got a downed aircraft and the right. water's roiling on top right. of this. But right. as they look down, they realize that there is this, what looks to be this Tic Tac, but this Tic Tac is floating over the water and it's behaving like a ping pong. It's it's not flying in in a, in a linear fashion that you would right. expect with a leading edge, a trailing edge, a nose, a tail, right, and aerodynamics. Right. It's kind of doing this all over the place, and uh, obviously that was that was rather startling. That it's, it's not a helicopter; it's moving too fast to be a helicopter. There's no control surfaces, uh, no wings, no ailerons, no elevators, no rudders, no cockpit, no obvious signs of propulsion. It's just this ping pong moving around so um dave fravor uh who's really you know like like you as you know as a fighter pilot you guys tend to be a, a rare breed i also i often uh, joke about dave that he's one of the few guys i know that actually runs towards danger and not away uh he's, a so, commander, right? he's he's kind of a big yeah. deal yeah well he's also top gun he's also a top gun guy so yeah. i mean he's he is he's probably the most seasoned pilot uh on the carrier on the boat, I mean, yeah. he's, so he's yeah. legit this is a legit guy oh yeah he's way legit and so he says hey i'm gonna go you know take a look and get close to this thing and uh the other pilot's like yeah cool i'm just gonna hang out here i'll, 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 I'll keep <laughs> i'll keep high cover because i don't know what that is <laughs> you know <laughs> let me know uh, how so <laughs> yeah right you know I'll, I'll i'll watch from up here and so dave goes in and as dave and his wizzo start to come in <laughs> This tic tac all of a sudden orientates itself directly at him, almost like like pointing at him, right? Like, right. hey, I know you're here. Right. And as so Dave starts to come in uh, on a slow and steady arc, this thing starts to mirror his position, maintaining a safe distance, right. not letting Dave get close, uh, but but mirroring his his image and meeting and, and coming up to meet him. So so now you're talking about an object that is, is somehow aware of the presence of U.S. military aircraft and is being controlled intelligently by someone or something. Right. And as Dave comes in, he's he's he, he kind of loses his patience. Him and the Wizzo, they said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm screw it. I'm just going to go ahead and and, and and cut this in half. I'm just going to come straight in at it and see what happens. They so, have tape running. This is all recorded. Uh, there is. Uh, I'm going to be very careful what I say here. There yeah. is there is video evidence of There's of. 
this craft, this data. So he cuts in and comes in. And as he starts to close the gap, this thing just boom, disappears over the horizon. And it does so uh, at, at, an, at an incredible velocity and disappears over the horizon in about, about two seconds, maybe less. So give and me numbers this, by disappearing, how, what, what's the distance range? So we're gonna get to that right now. So okay. here's okay. exactly what happens. So about five seconds later, the Princeton comes in and says, uh, hey, you're not gonna believe this, but we had this thing on radar and it's waiting for you at your cap point. Now a cap point is a rendezvous point right. that is is pre-established by the pilots. It's nothing that is broadcast. It's nothing that can be yeah. uh, exploited or extrapolated. It's 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 there, and right. you're looking at a distance of 65 miles from where they were to where this object is now in five seconds. In seconds. So five seconds. So you're you're talking. Think about moving 65 miles in five seconds. That is That's faster than more than there is. And in yeah, orbit, that's about 17,500 miles an hour, right? We go about five Talking. miles a second in orbit. So that's, yeah. they, they, they were going 13 miles a second if I'm doing my math in public, right? So they're yeah. going almost three times orbital velocity. Right. So if the data is is correct, that's exactly what 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 occurred. And that's the, the Nimitz incident. So then uh, they're running low on fuel. They go back to the, to the aircraft carrier. They, they scramble two more. They launch two more uh, F-18 Hornets because one of the, these guys is a hotshot marine who says, you know what? I'm going to go find this thing. I, I'm, I'm yeah. going to go get it. Right. And, and he did. And that is the famous uh, Tic Tac video. Um, so the so, video was that when you hear the guys yelling and you, you can see it moving and there's a weird line of sight because it's not, I don't think the video is right off the nose of the airplane, right? It's kind of, it's looking off to the side as it's tracking the Tic Tac. Yeah. You so you have you, against the background. Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden it just kind of bang shoots off and uh, the, the camera's not moving. It's the object is definitely moving. And that of course is backed up by radar. It's not right. just some grainy video. People say, Oh, look, it's the dot and it, you're moving the camera. That's not at all what happened. And so uh, that's, that's the, the famous Nimitz incident. Uh, what people don't know is that there's been other incidents before that uh, in the same exact waters involving the USS Boxer. And there's been incidents after that in the same waters as we now see with the kid in the Omaha. So, uh, there, it, these things continue to occur. And I think people look back and they say, oh, it's episodic, you know, I know about the Nimitz incident, I know about the Roosevelt incident. Yeah, but what you don't know, this is continuing to occur to this day. This is, hasn't stopped. This is not, it, this is not just a one-off. So that, so something is happening under the water. This thing is in the air. Does it go up into space? Well, we've caught them at, so remember what I said about the spy one radar. We, yeah. it can pick up a baseball at 80,000 feet. Right. It picked these it's objects up. This way. It's not looking correct. Necessarily in right, space. right. So right. what we do know is these things have been picked up at eighty thousand feet, and within within a second or less, they we see them dropping out of sky and then hovering over the water at fifty feet over the water, and then popping back out again. In the words of Kevin Day, who by the way is probably one of the world's premier radar operators, also a Top Gun graduate, in his words, it was raining UFOs. And you could see that on the scope. And now, as we've seen as wasn't just one. today, it wasn't just no, one. no, no, no. And it occurred over a period of days. And look, I'll, I'll tell you in your audience right now, and a video just came out that was authenticated by the Pentagon yesterday. Someone took a video of the radar scope uh, from one of the, the Navy vessels um, this this last year. And and wow. they are they are you can see them. They're right there on the scope. It's, it's so there's more than one track. There's more than one track. There's more than one target. Yes. And are they okay? Wow. So the military person in me is saying that you, this is a way to probe our defenses. You can see our reaction time. You can learn about our capabilities by doing what they're doing. They're not attacking us. They're not trying to shoot us down. They're. It seems more like a learning exercise than a aggressive exercise. Because I mean, it's definitely intention, intention provocative. Yeah, right. And it's provocative, but we're not sure yet hostile. And there's a difference. Right. And that's why we right. have to be careful. Because the moment you say it's a potential threat, people say, you know, you're fear mongering or how do you know it's hostile? Well, we're not. You know, look, air safety is an issue. It's a threat. If I've got a, a, a commercial 737 flying from Baltimore to, let's say, Denver, and it's got 230 people on board, you know, kicking back, drinking cocktails and, and waiting to see grandma. And right. you got one of these things coming up close and personal and the pilots aren't prepared 
Now you are in a situation where you might have to take evasive maneuvers. You have an air safety issue. You have a yeah. collision potential. You know, and and that's that's problematic. Is it is it hostile? No. Is it a threat? Yes. So that's you know we have to be careful when we use that terminology because I I had people misunderstand what what we were trying to say in the Pentagon, right. Uh, right. and uh, you know, so. So this has been going on. the The 2004 incident is the famous one, but you said there was incidents before this, and there's been incidents since then. Oh yeah, um, of yeah. these of these specific types of vehicles, whatever they are, um, of 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 some sort of high performance vehicle displaying what we would consider beyond next generation technology, the ability to yeah. perform uh, instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocities. Uh, stealth or cloaking or low observability, transmedium travel, and ultimately, right. uh, you know, what has been described. Yeah. Transme transmedium, meaning air, land, sea, space. Yeah, so it, it means space. Yeah, so as you know, we are, we are as a species, when we create, when you look at, you, you created, uh, let's say, a, let's just take, for example, an F-22 Raptor. Uh, one of our most capable fighter aircraft that we have right now. Uh, this is a, a, a high performance aircraft that is designed to fly in atmosphere. And so, you know, it's aerodynamic and whatnot. But when you compare that to, let's say, uh, a, a, a Russian proton rocket or, or the Soyuz spacecraft, right. um, you know, it doesn't look anything like an F-22 because that rocket, as you know, is gonna be performing maneuvers in outer space where there is no atmosphere. There's no atmospheric resistance. Right, exactly, right? I got so a model you have up thrusters. there, yeah, right. Yeah, and, and, and you, don't have, you don't have a jet engine, you have a, a chemical rocket engine because, you know, right. wings and, and jet engines are useless in space. And then when you compare that, let's say, to a submarine, it doesn't look like a rocket or a, a plane because it's, it's designed to operate underwater. In fact, it uses buoyancy and ballast to go up and down. It has a, a propeller to mechanically displace water. And right. that's why a submarine looks like a submarine. And right. if you want to create something that can operate in multiple environments, let's say a seaplane, there's always a, a design and performance sacrifice. A seaplane, as you know, is neither right. a really good plane nor is it a really good boat because it has to operate. It's a, it has to operate in both environments. And then you take the space shuttle, which is you know one of my personal favorites. It operates yeah. in the atmosphere and in space and on the ground. But right. as you know, uh, you know it's a design compromise. You, you, you the spaceship does you know yeah right. the, the space shuttle doesn't necessarily fly with a jet engine. It kind of glides back down to earth and right. you know because it's got a it, there's with these design compromises. Um, what These we are seeing, do it all. These tic tacs do, do it all without any type of performance or design compromise at all. Correct, I including space, space and underwater. Yeah, that's that's that for us is why this is so so uh, interesting. Because if let's just go down the rabbit hole for a second and assume that a foreign adversary has designed and, and implemented this and fielded Chinese, this technology, this right? Okay. Let's just say it's Chinese, and for the last several decades, the Chinese have managed to have this technology. That completely uh, makes obsolete every and uh, any weapon system that we have. Uh, they can fly over our airspace. There's not a damn thing we can do about it. They can fly over the White House within seconds, uh, uh, basically nullifying um, every single uh, aircraft missile uh, that, that that we have. All of it. Um, that's a problem. This would be a, a, an intelligence failure at the scale of of 9/11. Uh, because yeah. it means that despite our very best intelligence collection efforts and all 18 organizations and the billions of dollars we spend each year, um, we, 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 someone has managed to gain a strategic surprise and advantage over the United States. Uh, that's problematic. So at a minimum, that's what we're dealing with. Right. It could also be something very different. It might not be foreign adversarial. It might right. be a completely different paradigm that we're dealing with. And I think right. we need to keep all options on the table until they're no, no longer on the table. Right. No, I, I agree. And so it's almost like, so it's either human or it's not. And kind of the worst case scenario might be that it's human. Because <laughs> like, like you said, that would be a right. failure of, that would be the biggest failure in history of, of our military, which by the way, is- the I almost hope that it, it it's not human yeah. because that means we've got bigger problems on our hands. Yeah. Right. That would, that would be pretty awful. Okay. So we, so this is the Tic Tac. It's been around for decades, unbelievable performance. You know that is really uh, that that is something for sure. There's these other vehicles too. You talked about the triangles and the weather. I'm, they're not weather balloons. Maybe they are. I don't know. But the, if these things, if they're not going that fast, we ought to be able to track them and figure out where they came from, right? Yeah, 
one would think, and that's part of what we call the U.S. air domain awareness. Uh, there is a, a huge uh, conglomerate of U.S. government organizations that their whole job is to maintain awareness of of U.S. airspace, U.S. controlled airspace. Uh, that's the job of NORAD. That's the job of of the, uh, the the air domain awareness working group, interagency working group. I mean, this we put a lot of money, time, and effort, and talent trying to maintain awareness over our controlled space. And uh, there's a reason why there's a no fly zone over certain parts of Washington D.C. Right, because of of what happened in, during 9/11, we 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 keep a very close eye on our on our on those assets and equities that we were trying to protect, just like right. over our sensitive military installations. Right. So if there's a technology that can come out there, and and uh, you know unabated conduct reconnaissance and surveillance, uh, and there's not a damn thing we can do about it. Yeah, that's that's probably problematic. So Chris told me there was a, a Thad missile battery maybe in Guam and there's some Belgium F-16 pilots. So just run us through like what's been happening with the triangles, what's been happening with the, with the balloons or whatever, you know? Yeah. Well, the, the triangles uh, are something that have been seen for some time. Uh, they, this is, they've been seen internationally. They've been reported by military eyewitnesses backed up by electro-optical data and, and electromagnetic uh, capabilities like radar. So we are dealing with something. It is, it's real, whatever it is. Now, of course, there's all sorts of people that go into the, down the rabbit hole of, 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 of speculation. Uh, there's a lot of these conspiracy theorists that talk about it's some sort of secret US craft called the TR-3D. Uh, there's absolutely no, no indication or information that validates that. Um, and and you know, certainly when you're testing, you know this as a test pilot. We're, we're, let me ask you, Terry, when you test a, a new capability, where do you test that aircraft if there's something super secret we don't want to tell anybody? Well, you test it over a, 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 a test range, right? Or California. Yeah, right. There's the, right. In the, the desert Southwest is where we would test that stuff. Yeah. Do, would you fly that over downtown Chicago or <laughs> downtown LA if you wanted to keep it a secret? Probably not. There's pe people... Yeah, probably. Pe people have these things and they'll, uh, you know, they'll put it on Twitter if you do. <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, you know, it just, it doesn't make much sense. I mean, you are a test pilot yourself. You know the protocol for when we're testing something that we don't want our adversaries to see. And, you know, you don't, you don't do that type of test flight over major metropolitan populated U.S. cities. That's not how that's, you keep a secret. That's what's that's, happened with these things. That's what's exactly what's happened with several of these things. And, and they are being seen by, by, by a lot of eyewitnesses at the same time. Uh, but are they moving? That, is the triangle moving? You know, thirteen miles a second, like the Tic Tacs are. It can. So what we've seen is that typically they tend to to loiter okay. and move very, very, very slow, and then all of a sudden, and silently, and then all of a sudden, in a, in a blink of an eye, boom, they're gone, just like the Tic Tac over the horizon. Uh, and it, it's hard to 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 imagine something with that type of mass, right? Something that large. How big are they? Uh, think, how, how large is it? Well, that? some have been reported to be, you know, the size of, of a city block or so. And that, that's even, that's huge, right? That's a lot. Of, that, think of an aircraft carrier, right? You wouldn't an expect an aircraft that's not carrier. That's an airplane. That's an airplane. Right. right. That's, you know, that's an aircraft carrier. And imagine that thing all of a sudden, you know, deciding to to shoot over the horizon. And, you know, and, and by the way, no associated signature. So no sonic boom, no contrail, none of the things you normally associate with, you know, an aircraft flying in the sky. Um, even the acoustic signatures, like I said, sonic boom, it's not there. There's, there's no sonic boom. Okay. That's weird. I mean, there's air, it's moving through air. And when a rock, when a space shuttle comes back to earth, it makes the, the trail you can see for hundreds of miles, it's burning plasma. So these things yep. move that fast without leaving any plasma trail. Correct. There's no, there's no heat ablation. Wow. There's no atmospheric ionization that we typically associate and, and with with vehicles, uh, you know, and and friction, air air friction coefficients. All that is is it, it doesn't seem to apply here. Was there an incident in Phoenix? I remember reading about that um, with the triangles. That was triangles. The Phoenix lights. Now a lot of people get confused because you have Davis Montham down in Tucson, and it's yeah. common for the A tens to go up and drop out. You know, we call it Willy P white phosphorus. Right. flares and you can see them and right. you know in a, in a black background they can appear sometimes to look like shapes uh, but they they tend to burn out there was yeah. a mass sighting over they, Phoenix they, called they, the, yeah. yeah they descend right with 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 right with the rel and they go with the relative wind 
Um, but that's not what we're dealing with here. There's the Phoenix Lights were was seen by by hundreds, if not thousands, of people in Phoenix. It was even seen by the governor, when? Uh, who admitted this. Uh, well, you know what? I'm 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 going to do a, a thing here. I'm going to let your audience look that up because I don't want to give too much away. I think this will be a great homework assignment. Uh, it's called the Phoenix Lights. Just type yeah. that Phoenix Lights right. UFO incident, and okay. uh, the whole breakdown is there. Okay. Um, but even even the governor saw it. And he came out and he said, you know, at first he tried to make fun of it. He did this press announcement. And then later, uh, I guess because so many people were upset with him and said, you know, I saw it too. Don't make fun of it. He came out and said, no, you know what? I saw it too. And and it really wasn't funny. Uh, we, we don't know what this was. But So were they, here's the thing though. There are people with radar. Tra- if nothing else, the FAA has these air traffic control radars that are for airliners. So they should be able to see them on radar and they should be able to see where they took off and landed from. No. Well, that's part of the low observability issue that we have, because sometimes the radar, when you look from the pilot's perspective, they're having a hard time locking on. Sometimes they can lock onto it. Sometimes right. they can't. Sometimes they get these weird nonsensical returns, almost as if there's some sort of active jamming or spoofing going on. Right. Um, the long story short here is that we that my time in ATIP, there were some very smart people, not, you know, not me, excluding me, but there were some smart scientists and whatnot. Who was uh, who were able to come up with a very uh, interesting theory, and that uh, there is a certain technology that if 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 you if you can master it, all those five observables are possible. We initially thought when we first started ATIP that maybe there were five separate exotic technologies responsible for each one of these, you know, observables, and you see the the efforts and the dirts and all the reports that we did uh, with the government on on exotic propulsion and whatnot. But it turns out that if, if, if you know how to manipulate space-time, and, and, and not a lot, just a little bit, the space-time, fabric of space-time, all these observables are possible. It also may explain why we're having this, this weird, nonsensical return on radars. Uh, it also may explain why you don't have the associated uh, issues such as air friction, like we said, right, and, and the, the, the acoustic signatures. Um, it turns out that if, 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 you, if you know how to engineer and manipulate space time in a localized area, a lot of things that seem magical really all of a sudden become reality. Uh, and we've seen some of the micro experiments now at the CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, that, that seems to be substantiating a lot of this, this, uh, this, this speculation right now. So, the, so we're bringing in you know, nuclear physicists and astronomers and cosmologists to understand you know, extreme physics to explain what we're seeing on our F-18 radars and air traffic control radars and that kind of thing. That is the next step to, to open up the aperture of this and, and bring in under the tent a much broader audience, bring in people, contributors, bring in scientists, more scientists, more academics, uh, bring in, uh, you know, if it was up to me, rather than being a, a UAP task force, which as you know, in government terms means a temporary body to do a temporary job, I'd right. create an enduring capability. I would create something whole of government. I would do something like a federal national lab, like we have bringing the Department of Energy, FAA, NOAA, DHS, DOD, the IC, the intelligence community, bring everybody, la di bring in uh, academia to come in from universities and, and look at this. I, I, would, I would look at this topic very much like a, uh, like a peaceful version of the Manhattan Project, where we bring right. the best and brightest to, to look at this. That's funny. Normally, I mean, the Russians have been stealing our stuff for 50 years and the Chinese are obviously active in trying to steal our technology. But now we need to do the same thing to figure out <laughs> what these things. We're, we're basically the, ta- the, the tables are turned on us. Um, so, OK, so triangles, what, what else? You, you just said they're the size of a city block. They can go from zero to a million instantly. What are they doing? Are they just moving around and observing us? Or well, that they- we don't know. I mean, there's a lot of people that 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 have theories, uh, right. you know, the problem for me is that we don't have enough data yet to, to really, um, where one theory stands out more than another, uh, and we need more data. And so I'm very careful never to offer my own opinion because I don't think we have enough data yet. Uh, there, there's a whole lot of reasons why something might want to be here. Uh, there's, intentions. there's the practical, I mean, yeah, intentions, right? I mean, there's a practical sense that, you know, if you're really dealing with some sort of exotic technology, uh, and, and if, so look, we, we know there's two ways to bend space-time. Uh, thanks to Einstein, E equals MC squared. And so what you have is either a lot of mass, and, and like the Earth's mass is, is disrupting space-time around us. 
mm -hmm. uh, perturbing it a little bit. And, and that's why our GPS uh, clocks, this atomic cesium clocks, uh, they run at a different rate than the, the clocks here on Earth because yeah. the, the, the mass of the Earth is actually warping space time. So yeah. the heavier an object is, the more it warps space time. Mm -hmm. Well, same thing with energy. It just turns out you need a whole lot of energy to, to warp space time. And it's possible that, you know, if you really wanted to get to the fundamental elements of the universe, uh, and, 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 and so let me backtrack a little bit. The smaller you go in, in, in size and mass, the tighter energy is held in little packets, if you will. So uh, if I take this glass of water and I change its phase, it's a one times 10 to the third energy release and it's called steam. And uh, you know, for, for quite a while, we've been using steam engines to do a lot of our work because it's an exponential to the third times greater uh, energetic yield. Well, it took the, the Chinese to, to realize that if you actually broke up the molecular bonds, a chemical you know, exothermic reaction like gunpowder, that's a one times 10 to the fourth yield. Uh, and then uh, we did that, of course, uh, mankind realized that in, in the 11th century. It took us about another thousand years to, to realize, well, if I, if I started splitting up the atom, not the molecule, but the atom itself, uh, a fission type reaction, um, that's a one times 10 to the fifth yield, okay, in terms of kiloton yield. Uh, right. And then it took about 25 years later for us to realize, well, hell, I can, I can break up the nucleus of an atom, right? And, and now that's an, a, literally a nuclear, not an atomic, but a nuclear yield, which is one times 10 to the sixth, or, or better referred to as a megaton yield, and so mm -hmm. forth and so yeah. on and so on. So the, right. the smaller you go down, right, the more, the more energy is, is, is held tightly, but when it's released, it's much, much more. And right. so one of the theories is that perhaps uh, if there was, a, if someone has figured out how to warp space time using energy, uh, they could be the using hydrogen, which is abundant, most abundant element in the universe, right? Uh, because it's already kind of broken up to its fundamental atom. The problem is, is that uh, if you wanted to mine hydrogen out in the universe, uh, it could take you quite a while because even though it's so abundant, it's it's um, it's dispersed. It's it's in, yeah. in, in in gaseous clouds. There's only one place you find hydrogen where it is super concentrated, and that's water, H two O. Once you or in a star, oxygen. you go in a star. <laughs> yeah, but or you that, go to a star. That right? would be that probably would. Yeah, prob probably not advisable. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, maybe maybe the reason why these things are hanging out around water is because, frankly, we're just a convenient gas station. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we we simply don't know. I mean, there's there's all sorts of different hypotheses that have been put forward uh, while while I was my time at ATIP. So the triangle. Let's. I'm going to get back to the triangles. Um, people have written that they're drones that the chinese have really you know they're just they're they're poking us in the eye with these drones um sure. i've got my dji I mean, drone you know it, it, these yeah. are just advanced drones what when, when when was the when was the drone first really implemented in the united states and and abroad from a from a, a commercially available perspective the, Probably about 10 years ago right the, the little quadcopters quadcopters yeah uh I remember when I was in the 1990s, late 1990s, I was part of the Pioneer and Hunter UAV program. Okay, Those were the best UAVs just before we had Predator and all that. These were basically miniature Cessnas that mm -hmm. we outfitted to be uh, remote controlled. And that was the best UAV programs that, that we had at the time. And then we came up with something I called Dark the Star. Hawk. Right. Yep. Yeah. I chased the right. Global Hawk when I was a test pilot in 1999-2000. Yep. Right. You got it. So, uh, and, and that was really, really it. Um, those are airplanes. Those are just that. airplanes without people. Those are not right. quadcopter exactly. my, drones. Right. My point being is that we were chasing these triangles back in the 80s and, and even earlier on before right. drone technology was 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 even even uh, not only right. a reality, but even, even thought of. So, right. you know, it's it, one can stipulate that these are all drones. Well, sure, maybe some of them are, but they weren't back then. You know, it's like going, as I told people before, it's like walking into King Tut's tomb for the very first time and all of a sudden seeing a fully assembled 747 sitting there. You know, right. the, the, it doesn't make sense. The, the time period doesn't make sense. You could go back now and put pieces of 747 back into the tomb now, but you wouldn't expect to see one, you know, the moment you open up a tube that has been sealed for three, 4,000 years. It, it just right. doesn't make sense. It's the same thing. So what... Where have the triangles been seen? There was a Guam, the Thad, Thad all is over a, the world. Fab is a surface. Very, yeah, all over the world. They've been seen in Russia. They've been seen uh, 
out of the Pacific, over the ocean. They've been seen in Europe. They've been seen in the United States. They've been seen in South America. Uh, pretty much wherever there's a human being, uh, a presence of human beings, they have been they have been seen. There, and these are legit report. These aren't guys on mushrooms, and these aren't the UFO Hunter Society of Russia or whatever. No, these are military trained military eyewitness people. Okay. These are, I'm not I'm not interested in grandma seeing some lights in the backyard. Right. My job right. was only with trained military observers, and that was backed right. up by some sort of, of of data. Okay, so you've seen data you've seen military reports you've i assume have you talked to people who've seen these things yeah absolutely and the and and they're legit people yeah they're legit people as legit as you are and, and are these well that's not very legit hopefully you found better than that um are these are these drones are these chinese drones that they figured out how to make uh, quadcopters flying flying around I mean, okay. I'm sure I'm, I'm going to push. Me. I'm going to be the skeptic. I'm going to push. Okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. You know, okay. again, uh, you know, look, let's, let's, let's deconstruct this logically. Okay. You're talking about your drone. Um, what's, how far can you fly your drone? Uh, well, unfortunately I crashed it in the lake behind my house, but when it, when it used to be a lot and it didn't bubble and float back up, it just went to the bottom, <laughs> but I'm, you know, a couple, how, how far can you fly? A couple kilometers, a couple kilometers. For okay. 20 minutes. Great. 20 minutes, right? Okay, yeah. so what type of technology uh, would it take to fly a drone, uh, not a couple kilometers, but, but perhaps several hundred miles, loiter over the deck of a, of, of a, of a ship for, let's say, three, four hours, and then uh, disappear uh, under the waves, and then do that night after night after night? Um, yeah. I'm going to ask you a serious question. What, what, what drone technology right now is available that we have that can do transmedium travel that can loiter by the way with no long range long distance right so so there's as we know how to communicate there's only two ways you can get over the horizon communications for something like that unless you you have a repeater aircraft right that's sending right. signals you right. can do it through satellite and and, and pre-arranged gps coordinates and, and satellite um or you've got to be closer to your target um well there isn't anything that we're seeing that's closer to the target. We sent, we're the only ships out there, some cases for, for, for a hundred miles. Uh, where are they being launched from? Where, where are they getting their fuel? If they're, they can't be using electric battery because you don't have the duration and the endurance. Yeah. So now you have to find an alternative fuel source, which means probably some sort of, 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 of internal combustion engine, which means now more weight, which means a bigger robust platform, which now means more, you know, more support services for that and, and launch capability. You can't just hold that in your hand to launch it. You're going to need some sort of, of, of launch pad somewhere that's stable enough to hold that type of weight for that type of enduring mission, right? And oh, by the way, not get shot down. Oh, by the way, you said your drone fell into the, into the lake. Well, we haven't found a single one of these drones floating in the water. We Are haven't we found one. Are we looking? Of course we're looking. Yes, absolutely. We're looking. My brain is spinning here. I, I'm working. I'm actually working with a UAM company, which, which is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, like a flying taxi. This is the big thing, and you know we're sure. looking at an hour, maybe two hours, maybe you know 100 mile range kind of thing, 100 miles an hour. Those are kind of right. the numbers that that the flying taxis are hoping to get to. They're not there yet, but they're hoping to. No, they're not. And, you're, and there's you're a lot of money. There's using... a lot of money in it. There's a lot of money being yeah. put doing that. Yeah, we're, we're using lithium ion batteries and, right. and we're looking at something that we still don't have the technology to do that. And yet that's exactly what we're seeing. So these so, are Navy ships. You're talking about U.S. Navy surface vessels, blue water ops. There's no horizon anywhere nearby. Correct. They're seeing these things fly over them in formation. Are they doing anything? What's happening out there? Sometimes they're just hovering over our, our capabilities for. for do we try and shoot them down? Uh, I, I'm not going to elaborate on what uh, countermeasures the U.S. government might or might not be employing. I'm going to leave right. that up to the government to, to make that statement. Uh, but, you know, as you know, we do have counter drone technology. Uh, we we yeah. do have that. Um, it's not yeah. it's not that tough to 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 zap one of these things if, if it was a drone. Um, right. You know, if, I, if, I, if I'm on my if I'm on my boat in the Chesapeake and, and I come within 300 you know, feet of a, of a ship, they, they they have the authorization to shoot me out of the water. And by the way, they will. So, uh, so the same thing that, holds true for drones. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend taking a drone and trying to, you know, uh, uh, 
tease a, a, a U.S. Navy warship. That's that's not advisable. <laughs> so obviously, we haven't been able to shoot one down, or we, you know, we have we haven't gotten one of these things, have we? Do these things exist in a hangar Area Fifty One, or even better, uh, Area? No one ever talks about Area Fifty Two. That's the that's, that's the area. right. <laughs> that's, that's right. Area Fifty Two. Yeah, I've said that before. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to going to elaborate. I've I've said for the record, uh, and I'll I'll stick to what I've said before. Uh, it is my uh, my belief that the U.S. government is in possession of of uh, extremely exotic material, and and that's about all I can say uh, about that right now. Um, I have to be careful of my I still have my 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 security clearance. Oh, you still have at a least today. I do. I still have my TS clearance. Okay, mine mine expired years ago. Um... Not that I, I never knew anything. I was at NASA there. I mean, that NASA is not a, a place of secrets. It's, you know, the, the Russians fly with us where it's, I never, I never, I never knew anything really good. So I'm learning more now than I ever learned when I was with the government. <laughs> so the, uh, so there are these, and these are all triangles that we're talking about right now. Uh, well, no, we're not talking about just triangles. We, we're, okay. we're now talking about drones, right? Cause we, 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 we switched right. from triangles, the large triangles, being observed to now now drones uh, that have been or what what people refer to as drones, which in really reality probably you know many cases aren't drones. Uh, in some cases they are, but you know uh, there therein lies the problem and some of the confusion because now people are, are are reporting so much, which is a good thing, right? We we want it's, it's the old say saying see something, you know say something. Uh, <laughs> right. So people are now finally reporting, uh, but with that you're going to get a lot of noise, you know, right. in that reporting. Right so now, now the challenge is separating, you know, the the noise from from the signal. Right. The uh, there was some video released recently. It looked like night vision goggles. It was that green, you know, night camera look of, and there were some Infrared. light. Infrared. Right. Exactly. And so that was, I think, was that a quote unquote triangle that they released? And there was also pictures well, of that, things. Yeah. That was a video of, of a vehicle. Now, the question, the jury is still out. Was it an effect of the lens, what was referred to as bokeh effect, uh, because the aperture as the lens closed becomes a triangular shape, and what you're seeing is actually just a, a conventional aircraft or drone through that effect, or are we looking at something truly legitimate? Uh, is it an actual active light source coming from the aircraft that's blinking uh, like an aircraft navigational lights? Or are those lights actually being reflected off of a smooth bottom uh, from from something below? There, there's still a lot of, of of questions regarding that. That video came out after I left the Pentagon. I, I know a little bit about that particular incident, but I certainly don't have available to me all the information. So I, I want to be careful not to speculate too much. Right. Uh, the Pentagon has has said that it was a legitimate video uh, and it was being yeah. used by the UAP task force. But beyond that, um, you know, it, I, I want to be careful to speculate. OK, How, so but again, if it's a drone, it may be low observable, but it's not zero observable. And we should be able to track where it takes off from and lands at. And if it's a drone and open water operations, it's got to be taken off and landing from a boat or a submarine or something. I mean, there, you that's know, right. The that's right. Drones that can hover can't travel thousands of miles. Exactly. And those and that can do, travel you thousands can of them. miles can't yeah. hover. Right. Exactly. And that's my it, point that if right. before fixed wing, it's got to move. You got to create the, lift under the wings the, and you have to be going. Hop, a, right. A, right. You have to have a su sufficient speed yeah. to maintain lift. If you want to hover, then, you can your loiter time goes way down because your energy now is being transferred rather than from 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 horizontal to to right. vertical right right and so you're 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 wasting your fuel that doing that yeah. so yeah. there's no real capability we have right now that can fly for th thousands of miles and then hover for three or four hours and then fly thousands of miles it, we, that's just we don't have that yet so if there's a destroyer out in the middle of the Pacific and these things show up, clearly the SPY-1 radar is tracking it. Where did it come from and where did it go? Great question. That's yeah. absolutely correct. And look, okay. things don't just appear. If you, well, I can tell, yeah, I mean, with the Nimitz incident, you know, they popped in at 80,000 feet. They came in from somewhere. We, we picked them up at 80,000 feet. So that means they came in from higher than that. And we picked them up at 80,000 feet. And then we retract them going 50 feet over, hovering 50 feet over the water and then bouncing back up and zip, zipping off 
past 80,000 feet again. Where it went, nobody knows, but we were looking up to 80,000 feet and it went beyond 80,000 feet. So, wow. you know, you, you tell me. And there and there's data here, but the problem with is the the government bureaucracy classification system is that as you know there's so many holes and <clears throat> it's all need to know so i may have seen one thing but i don't know so there's not a lot of people that have i'm sorry yeah. i apologize i took my phone i just uh i just got interrupted so that's why we lost signal i apologize okay. i'm being uh I'm being told that I I, I have uh, I think I have a, a schedule conflict right now. I was told that uh, I have some folks waiting, so I just want to just let you know I got probably a couple minutes, but okay. uh, I think um, I'm going to have we'll to wrap it up, uh, and we can come back again and do this some other time as well if you want. I hate to be this way, but I, I guess they had scheduled us for an hour, and now uh, I'm I'm already stepping on the toes of of, of somebody right now. Let's wrap right. it up. Bull these balloons, these Navy, or if there's some pictures of these translucent balloons, anything interesting about those? If it's a balloon, again, we should be able to track it. What, what are these things doing? Sure. Sure. Again, that's that you're, you're asking the questions that, that we've all asked. If these are balloons and we should know it's a balloon, they should have a very specific path. And by the way, balloons do not travel against the wind in 120 knots. That doesn't happen. Balloons float with the wind, with the prevailing winds. They don't, they don't go against it, as you know, right? Unless these they have things some sort are. Of they're not floating device. they're not floating with the wind they're moving no they're moving you can no we have the the radar data we have it on gun camera footage you can see them they are moving right. against the headwind i mean it's not you know the ones that are of interest to us are the ones that are not behaving like a balloon and, and okay. that's what i think people fail to recognize that's that for us is 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 a litmus test a balloon is a balloon uh, you know a balloon doesn't behave like an aircraft uh, right. unless it's some sort of hybrid technology which is something that we're really not not aware of yet the balloon's airspeed is always zero and their ground speed is whatever the wind speed is and so that this, Ab this absolutely is happening right okay i, I you got to go lou this conversation is not over i i want to know the real data and that's compartmentalized and secret places where with people that aren't talking with each other and i i, I know the I don't know the bureaucracy specifically, but I can, I, and I can, I know the bureaucracy <laughs> where all this stuff is hidden. Understood. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for coming on board. I know we gotta, we gotta run your, your. Late. Sorry, I've got one question for you, even though yeah. I've, 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 I've got to jump here. I have heard that space has a very distinctive smell, almost like an ionization yes. smell. Now, obviously it, the vacuum of space doesn't really have a smell, but there's, there's a, a something associated. Can you, can you share with me for just a moment? Because I'm dying to know from somebody yeah. who's just been there. The smell of space. So what does a strawberry smell like? Uh, great question. It's hard it, to explain, it, right? It's hard it to describe like a smell. a smell, right? Yeah. There's all kinds of smells that's hard to describe. So um, when a space walker comes inside in his spacesuit, you can go up and smell the, the fabric of the spacesuit. Or when a cargo ship docks and you open the hatch, you can you can go smell the part of the spaceship that was just out and it it's kind of musty it's kind of electric I, like the old railroad trains that we had when we were kids um yeah. there was that electric smell uh it, it's mechanical it's it's if i smelled it i would go you were just in space you know i would know it immediately um but it's hard to describe it but i i would describe it as musty electrical and unlike anything else i'd ever smelled before wow yeah. fantastic thank you for sharing that with me i've always been told that i just i, I was dying to hear from, from from an expert like you who's actually been there and done that so thank you i appreciate that it's a very unique sure of course well i know you got to run thank you thank you for having us it. being on the show and hopefully maybe we'll do it again anytime thank you very much terry thank you for your Absolutely. service really appreciate it we'll, we'll see you bye-bye take care